Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> The Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. To become a member, go to rmef.org. And the podcast is also brought to you by OnX Maps. And with OnX Maps, you can know where you stand with the most accurate hunting GPS tech on the market with land ownership maps that work offline. Go to onxmaps.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 20% when you sign up for an app membership at onxmaps.com. The podcast is also brought to you by Gerber. Uh, go to gerbergear.com and learn about the knives, the vital, the big game vital, the Gator Premium, all the things that we use when we're out in the woods and not just knives, but also some really cool multi-tools that they have. We're also proud to partner with Sitka Gear. And if you go to sitkagear.com, you'll see their full line of clothing. And their tagline is turning clothing into gear. And they are doing that through advanced technology that allows you to stay in the field longer, hunt harder, and stay safer. The Elk Talk podcast is also brought to you by GoHunt.com. Uh, go to GoHunt.com and sign up for the Insider. Um, the, the insider is changing how haunts and hunting information are found. No doubt about that. Use promo code ELKTALK, and when you do, when you sign up for the insider, you're going to get $50 of store credit, mad money, in their gear shop. And we are also brought to you by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is the original designer and inventor of the pallet plate diaphragm that's completely changed the way elk calls are made and used. And to find out more and to order your elk calls, go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or BuglingBull.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 15% on all of your elk calls and elk call accessories. And with that, Corey... We are ready to get into it. Let's jump into it. All right, folks. Well, welcome to another episode of the Elk Talk podcast. And Randy and I are joined remotely through technology here. Randy's in, I'm guessing, sunny Bozeman, and I'm in sunny Idaho. And we're, uh, I'm looking at Randy on the Skype screen here, and it's, uh, this is about as good as it gets for us being together especially this close to elk season and you know randy's already been on a hunt and uh, we're getting ready to head out chasing elk here this week as well so we thought we'd check in and get another episode for uh for elk talk podcast so that everyone else who's heading out elk hunting will have some content fresh content to listen to here so yeah randy how is uh how is the weather in bozeman uh, the weather here is really nice because I just got done with two weeks in Nevada and I don't know if you can see it on the Skype video, but my beak, my nose is sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> like really, really bad sunburn. I don't know whose idea it is to open seasons in Nevada in August, but it was hot, which kind of is a good lead into the topic we want to discuss today. Yeah. Yeah, we've been getting a lot of uh, a lot of questions, a lot of emails and messages coming through, and a couple of them have been focused on how do I take care of meat when I get an elk down and it's really hot out. 
So we're going to we're going to dive in and talk about warm weather meat care today and just some of the challenges and some of the tactics that we used cuz I know both of us have opportunities to hunt early. I like elk hunting early and a lot of times you're dealing with heat. When we were in New Mexico a couple of years ago, it was late September and we were still dealing with a lot of heat. So it's it's important to be prepared and have the resources and the understanding of what needs to take place to make sure that we don't lose any elk meat due to the heat. And Yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking about the seasons. I know uh, Idaho, you guys open archery season the end of uh, August. Yeah, August 30th. Nevada is August 20th, 15th to 20th, somewhere in there. Same for uh, Utah, September 1st in uh, New Mexico. Colorado is usually the last weekend in August. So there's a lot of states in, and even right now in Oregon, aren't they? Last weekend, wasn't that the opener for? Yeah, the last last Saturday in August, I believe. So they opened, uh, was it August 23rd, 24th, somewhere right in there. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out elk hunting when the temperatures can be really hot. And if you would have shot a bull in Nevada when I was there last week, it was 96 degrees one day. And I, I think about, whew, I, uh, that's a big chunk of meat that you got to get taken care of, cooled down in short order because of the uh, just the, the risk of it spoiling. Totally. Yeah, there's, you know, there, I always start off saying there's three things that are bad for elk meat. The first one is bugs and dirt and debris, which, you know, a game bag will take care of that. Uh, the other one is moisture, which you don't want moisture on meat because moisture starts that bacterial process of spoiling and, and growing bacteria on the meat. And then the last one is heat, and heat is is bad. But I, I think sometimes we look at it and think, you know, it's 75, 80 degrees out. If that meat sits out in the sun, it's just going to go bad instantly. And there is some truth to that, but I think there's a lot of things that you can do to prevent that and to minimize the effects of heat. And I think uh, we can jump into that and talk about a few of those things, but just keeping in mind that even in those hot conditions at 90, 95 degrees, it's possible to, to take care of the meat and not lose any meat. It's just, you need to be prepared and you need to work quickly sometimes and have a game plan in place because I think that's the thing that hurts most people. It's not the fact that it's just too hot. It's the fact that things aren't getting done to to prevent that from happening. So Yeah, and I think a lot of people may not mentally just be dialed in because they don't, I mean, I, I and I say this, based on the amount of experience I fortunately have in gutting and gilling, as I call it. I, I tell all of our guest hunters, look, you get the pleasure of shooting it, but one of my favorite parts is doing the gutting and gilling. So <laughs> I maybe get a little more practice than uh, others. But I know when I first started elk hunting in the first few that I shot and I started doing the gutless method, it took me a lot longer than it does now. And I tell people, don't wait until you've got that bull laying on an open hillside in Idaho or New Mexico or wherever for it to be the first time you've tried the gutless method. You know, they probably they live somewhere where there are deer nearby. And it's a matter of scale, really, between deer and elk. So I suggest that people practice so that when you're hunting in these hot weather conditions and you've been practicing on deer at home, it's not as intimidating, it's not as big of a challenge, and you can get it done a lot quicker. Because I'm with you, the getting it done as quick as possible is the best way to reduce the likelihood uh, of any spoilage. Yeah, and there's a reason for for doing it quickly. You just have to realize what's going on there. That elk is a heat missile. I mean, that it's full of meat. The meat is hot. I don't know what the body temperature of an elk is, but it's it's hot. You know, it's it's not going to do well if it stays at that temperature once the blood quits flowing through it. And that hide on that elk, even this time of year, is an insulator. I mean, it really is just a huge insulating blanket. It's a thick hide. 
And so what you have is you have a, we'll just use the, the temperature of 100 degrees, for instance, and assume that meets at 100 degrees. When that elk dies, if it was exposed to air all around it, it still has that hide on it that insulates the meat and keeps it from cooling down. It holds the heat inside there. So the number one thing is you've got to get that hide off quickly. That hide is going to insulate the meat and keep the heat inside that you want to be able to expose to the outside air and let it cool off. So number one thing, and I feel is the most important thing when it comes to making sure the meat tastes good, is get the hide off. The longer the hide sits on it, the more chance you're going to have a gamey flavor to the meat and the more chance, especially this time of year, that the heat is going to sit in there and start souring the meat. And if you can get that hide off and just expose those quarters to the outside air, even if the outside air is 80 degrees, it's going to start the cooling process and that heat's going to start moving from the meat to the outside air and, and allow that meat to start cooling. And then the other thing is when you think about uh, meat spoilage, you very rarely lose meat that is exposed to the sun. It's not, it's not exposure to the sun at 80 degrees or 90 degrees that causes the meat to spoil initially. It's the heat trapped inside the bone. And so those bones, especially that hind quarter inside that, that bone is where it's the hottest. That's where the heat has the hardest time escaping. And so you give, you've got to get the hide off quickly, and then you've got to get that heat from inside the quarter uh, right at the bone. You've got to let it out. You've got to find a way to, to let it escape. Yeah. Um, the I, As we were talking, uh, I did a Google search of what the body temperature of elk is, and it's 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's so you, you think about us at 98, when we get to 104 degrees, we've got a fever. It's, yeah. it's bad. So, I mean, it's, it doesn't seem like a lot more, but 104 degrees trapped inside an insulated hide is not going to cool very quickly. Yeah, not, not at all. And so one of the things that uh, contributes to that also is then you have this stomach cavity with all this bacteria in their gut that is still alive and creating even more heat, which is what causes the bloating. That's the expansion of the gases in the gut area. So you have a lot of heat sources there that are really creating problems for potential meat spoilage if you don't take care of it as soon as you possibly can. Yeah, and I would honestly say in hot temperatures like this, if an elk, and you, and you think about uh, that elk laying on a hillside, the side that's air up, that's exposed to the sky, is going to cool a lot quicker than the side that now is, is trapped by the insulated hide it's also being insulated by the ground. So it's that bottom side that usually spoils. If you let it sit there for two hours in this kind of heat and don't get the hide off of that bottom side, there's a chance that you're going to start seeing that bone sour where it's spoiling at the bone within a matter of two hours. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are saying, okay, I, I get all that. I, I want to get the hide off as quick as possible. This elk is laying there. Maybe it's expired in a pile of brush under a blowdown. Maybe it is way out in the wide open. Uh, I, I don't really have a absolute set way in which somebody or in which I have to do, okay, I got to do a front quarter first and then a hind quarter or whatever. I do it based on what the body position and the the debris pile looks like. Because I've had elk slide underneath a big deadfall that I couldn't get rid of, and I had to do the hindquarters first. And then I've had some situations where, okay, they're laying on their side. I'm going to get that front quarter off first. I'm going to get the back strap out, and then I'll get the hindquarter. Uh, if, if all things being equal, I prefer to remove the hindquarter first. But everyone has their own idea, own methodology to it. And uh, I, I, I guess my people ask me, well, what do I do first? I say, well, do whatever looks the easiest first, and it'll all come together. Don't, don't spend 15 minutes contemplating, oh, should I do this or should I do that? <laughs> Jump in there and know that regardless of the order you do it in, it has to be done. So in hot weather... Uh, I, I always try to get the hindquarters off first just because they're the larger mass. And the sooner I can get those off, 
and get them in game bags and hang in somewhere where air can circulate around them, that's a larger mass of meat that I'm a little bit more worried about. But I, if, if I can't get to them right away and I got to take the other pieces apart just so I can move the carcass if I'm all by myself... I'll take the front shoulder off and I'll take the back strap off one side and then maybe I can get myself into the hind quarter. But do you have any, yeah. any specific way in which you do it? You know, we do, we have a, we have a process down and you mentioned something there that is definitely worth mentioning. And that's if you're by yourself, if you're by yourself, it's going to double the work and it's going to <laughs> double the time. And yeah. uh, for us, you know, if, if there's two of us there, which there usually is, one of us will immediately start skinning and get that skin off of one side. So when we do it, we basically go up the up the front side of the back leg, across yep. the belly, and then to the back side of the front leg and cut that and then basically just roll that whole side of the hide up off of the quarter, the stomach, everything, the hind quarter, the stomach, the front shoulder, the neck, yep. all of that hide gets rolled up. And it's, you know, basically all the way to the back strap and the spine is exposed. Yep. That allows heat to start coming out. So, I mean, that's, that's the first step. Get that hide off of that first side. While one person's doing that, the other person is making a, mate, uh, a makeshift meat pole. So we're taking a, a chunk of a, you know, a, a log, a, a sapling, something that's going to be able to hold four quarters. And we're lashing it between two trees. And that's really important because with that up, as soon as we start taking quarters off, we can hang them, air is circulating around all sides. If you pull a hind quarter off and just lay it in a game bag on the ground, that heat's still insulated on the ground side and it's going to cool about three times slower than if you have it hanging and air can circulate all the way around it. So we get one person pulling the skin off, one person making the meat, meat pull, usually get done about the same time. And then we start in and start attacking each quarter. So one of us jumps on the front, one jumps on the back and we get done. We put them in game bags, take them straight to the meat pole and then decide what to do from there. But I think that getting the hide off is, is critical. Number one, uh, getting that meat pole to be able to hang and you can hang, you know, if there's limbs there and you can just hang quarters from limbs, you don't have to make a meat pole for us. It's just super easy. We get all of them there and can, can work on it. If you're by yourself, I would still say, get the hide off first yeah. With the hide off, then you can make a meat pull really quickly if you need to. If not, if there's limbs there, you immediately start. And I would say start on the hind quarter, kind of like you. If you have a choice, uh, that's the biggest piece. That's the one that's going to hold the heat the most, and you want to open that up. And one of the things we do when it is hot, and this is probably a pretty critical component to it, is when you pull that hind quarter off, even if you're going to leave the meat on the bone in the quarter, if you aren't going to do the boneless, if you take a knife and basically just run it down from the from the top of the hind quarter, following that leg bone all the way down and just open that back ham, just slice it wide open, pry it open with a stick. I mean, steam will come pouring out of that because that bone holds so much heat in there. And you just want to open that up and let that heat come out. The problem with when you go boneless is you take these great big chunks of bo or of, of meat and you pull them off of the bone and you stuff them in a game bag. And now you have this great big Mass. Uh, yeah. bag of meat and that meat in the middle can't let any heat out. It's yep. just sitting there holding that heat in there and it acts like a, a big ball of insulation. So I like to leave it on the bone, even when yep. it's hot out, I just open it up, make that cut. And you only have to do it in one place because all of that heat from the bone is going to look for the easiest path out. And that meat's going to cool really efficiently like that. Yeah, I, I always leave bone in uh, just because it's going to create more air surface or, you know, surface area for which the heat to expand than if it's all balled up in one big pile. You yeah. don't have enough surface area for heat transfer. And those of us who at least took a little bit of engineering in college, right? <laughs> Heat and mass transfer. I hated that class. <laughs> that's, that's why I switched to accounting. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's definitely this concept of the amount of surface area you have is a function of how quickly heat transfers. So keeping a bone on, you do create more surface area than if it's just all one great big round blob of meat with 
uh, you know, and, and both in terms of dimension also, because that hind yeah. quarter is narrower than once. You, it, if you think about when you cut the meat off the bone, you kind of get this soft, big ball, almost like a ball of jello. Uh, and like you said, in the middle of that, there's just not enough surface area and not rapid enough heat transfer for that heat to get out of there. And it can spoil quickly if you do it that way. So that's why I always leave the bone on. Yep. And there, you know, it'll save you weight taking the bone out to pack, but we aren't to that phase yet. Right. And even if you want to just leave it hanging there and an hour later, start peeling pieces of, of meat off of the bone, it's going to cool enough in that hour. And I'm talking, even if it's 85 degrees out, if you hang that meat in the shade... With wind, it especially. Will, it will get cold and clammy to the touch within about 30 minutes. And that's what you want. Yep. Yeah, you just I, don't want it in that direct sunlight with any kind of insulation. You want to expose as much as you can to the outside air because you're going from 104 degrees to 85 degrees. That's a delta of almost 20 degrees. That's cooling. That's starting the cooling process. Yeah. And if you're in the shade and it's 70, 75 degrees, that's even that much faster. And within 30 minutes, you're going to be able to feel, hey, this meat's cooling down good. The inside, when you reach in and touch the bone, when you first kill that elk, when you cut that back quarter open and you reach in and put your hand against the bone in there, it feels hot. Yeah. Like it doesn't feel warm. It feels hot. Yeah. And 30 minutes later, you're going to reach in there and realize all of that meat that's exposed to the outside air now feels cool and clammy to touch and it's yeah it's going to be okay one of the things that you run into when you have uh somebody who uh, they have the elk down and they decide you know i want to save the cape and mount this thing you have a little bit more of a challenge of getting the heat out of there because uh, just how you have to cut the cape you make a dorsal cut down and I go way down past the last rib. I give my taxidermist way more than he'd ever need to work with. But once you do that, then you're kind of skinning the other way to get that top side exposed. I quickly start skinning. You know, if you can imagine a dorsal cut way back almost to the last rib and then a cut down to the stomach. Now I take that corner or that flap and I just start peeling that towards the front quarter and get all of that off there. And then uh, it's easy to, you know, you really aren't worried about the hindquarter high part of the hide. So you just get that hindquarter hide off there as fast as you can. And you common get, uh, commonly get the question of, do you leave the hide on to keep it clean or do you take the hide off? I don't care what time of year, I always take the hide off. Absolutely. I, I've never quartered an elk where I leave the hide on. Um, even in cold weather, I, I take the hide off, but especially in hot weather like this, never leave a quarter hanging there with the hide on. You're, no. you're going to have a lot of stinky meat in short order. Yeah. That's like wrapping the, the meat in an insulation blanket, <laughs> trapping the heat inside of it. You've, you've got to get that hide off. Yeah. So for me then, it, what I've done at times and I will do it. Uh, if, uh, again, it depends on if it's on a steep incline, uh, all things, you know, if it falls in one of my preferred locations, I will take the hind quarter off one side, I'll roll it over and take the hind quarter off the other side. So there's times I'll take both hind quarters off. And then as quick as I take those hind quarters off, um, I, I get them in bags right away. And then I go to work on, and this is if I'm by myself, uh, then I go to work on the front quarters and, and the back straps. And the reason that being is, like I said earlier, they're just the mass of the, the size of the meat. And then also just, it's a lot easier to manage that carcass once the two hind quarters are off than it is, you know, trying to roll the whole thing at one, you know, roll it from one side to the other. But I end up having to do it the other way, you know, do the top side, roll it over, do the bottom side. It, it just depends on where it's laying, how much help I have, uh, how hot it is, what time of day. Uh, <laughs> I mean, doing yep. it in a headlamp with a headlamp is uh, even more of a challenge. But the good part then is it's nighttime and the temperatures are dropping, so you're in less of a hurry. But if you shoot that bowl at 10 in the morning this time of year, you really have your hands full because it's getting hotter by the hour. And, yep. and for me, I like that midday hunt, you know, especially early like this. You get those bulls that are just, they aren't herded up yet. Uh, they're very 
territorial. They stay right in that one little area. And I like to go in there and target those bulls between like 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And you shoot a bull at 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when you really get into trouble because that sun is direct. It's the hottest part of the day. It's, you know, staying hot for another 2 or 3 hours. And like you said, that 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock, it's just getting hotter every minute. So it's super critical. And I think you mentioned something really important at the beginning, Randy. It's important to know what you're doing. Even if you've never done it before, educate yourself as much as possible on the process. Visualize the process. Think of the steps of, I've got to get the hide off quickly. I've got to get the meat off of the carcass and hanging. I've got to cut open that that back quarter those are the first steps. Don't worry about cutting fat off of the meat. Don't worry about, you know, pulling off individual pieces if you're going to bone it out. Get that meat hanging so air can circulate around it. Get all four quarters off. Get the back straps. And for the back straps, I don't usually hang them because they end up a big ball of meat if you hang them in a bag. Yep. So we'll put those full length and kind of leave them strung out in a bag and then set them uh, over a couple limbs or something so that they are exposed on bottom and top to the air. And then the neck meets probably one of the, the areas that I think has the most potential to start spoiling other than the, the hind quarter, but the hind quarter, I think you get off first. That neck meat though is usually the last thing you pull off because you have to get that front shoulder off to really dig in and, and get it. Yep. And that neck is just a big mass of muscle and you've got the vertebrae running up through the middle of it that holds heat. And so, you know, that's one of those things that I usually do break those off into individual pieces of meat and then try to set them out, let them cool individually a little faster than, than the quarters would cool. Yeah. And like, uh, I'll use an example of what I had to do last week in Nevada. Uh, our guest hunter shot an antelope and that's a far smaller mass of meat than an elk, but it was 94 degrees. And I'm out there, there's not a tree anywhere to hang anything. It's, I'm in borderline panic mode of, you know, is this thing going to spoil? Well, down in this little wash, I found some rocks that were still shaded at 11 in the morning. And I just had to take these individual pieces, like you were saying, the back strap, and I put them in their own bag and I went and laid them in the shade on these cool rocks that were still uh, they were still cooler than the air temperature because of the, you know, at night the temperature drops. And so uh, the reason I bring that up is sometimes you just got to look around and say, all right, what do I have here that I can utilize that allows a lower temperature to draw heat out of this high temperature meat? And you get putting big bags of trimmed out meat in one mass is the equivalent of putting that hind quarter boned out in one big mass. Yep. I bring a few extra game bags and know that if I have to for, like you were saying, 20 or 30 minutes, I got to let my back straps hang individually and just only in a game bag uh, draped across a, a limb or something. Uh, in that 20 or 30 minutes, that temperature is going to drop enough that, okay, now maybe I can put two of them in one game bag and start using that game bag to cool off an extra a neck roast or whatever but the the point of that is is whatever you do don't trim up big chunks of meat and have 60 pounds of backstrap tenderloin trim meat neck roast hanging in a game bag and then wonder why the heat wasn't able to dissipate totally yeah yeah i mean it really there are definitely uh, things that you learn that, that you can apply through your experience, but it really comes down to common sense. Just you have a big ball of meat there and it's hanging and it's hot. You want to open it up. You want to, you know, just like when you're cooking a piece of chicken on the grill, if it's a great big round chunk of meat, the middle is going to take longer for the heat to get into. Well, the same concept applies on the reverse. That heat's going to take longer to get out from the middle. So if you're able to open it up and expose that middle, it just makes that process go so much faster. Yeah. I, so kind of going to the next step, what my effort is, is try to get everything, get the hide off and get everything off the carcass as quick as possible and assume there's some shade somewhere. You know, the, it might just be pinyon or juniper trees somewhere, you know, like in Montana and, a, and Idaho where you and I hunt. Very often there's the shade of large trees. So we're a little bit spoiled there. But once I get the meat off the carcass, 
then it becomes the process of okay now what do i do do i what do i haul out first how do i what do i dare let hang overnight when do i bone it out when do i not bone it out uh stuff like that and for me uh once everything's hanging uh if, if i have say i'm by myself um I'll probably, the first load I'll haul out once I feel that I've let it cool enough is I'll haul the trim and the back straps and, and all that other stuff and I'll haul it out and once I get to my camp, I will spread it out as much as I possibly can to allow it to continue to cool. Knowing that, all right, back there at the tree, I still have the four quarters hanging with bone in. And maybe I can get back there that afternoon. Maybe I can only get one more load out. Um, but usually by the time I get back there, those quarters have cooled because the wind's been blowing on them and they've been in the shade. And that's when I'll start boning out. Not until it that temperature has dropped will I bone it out. And then once I bone it out, then I can start doing my my shuttles back and forth and sometimes if i got to leave some hanging there at night the next morning when i come back it's amazing how cooled off that meat is and then i bone it out and i'm hauling out a cooled off big mass of meat yep no we do the same you, you've got to find shade you know and like you said you can almost always find shade you might have to move the meat every two hours to to keep it in the shade yep but that's the the second important step once you get it off of the carcass once you get that height off and everything then you want to get the meat in the shade if it's out in the sun that slows the process and it might allow that heat to stay in there long enough to spoil it so then you want to get it in the shade and one of the things that we found is if there's any kind of moisture whether it's a spring just a cool draw anything like that it's worth hauling the meat 200 yards and hanging it there because that 10 degree drop in temperature just 100 yards away or 200 yards away again is going to contribute to that meat cooling faster so we'll sometimes we'll 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 make our meat pole our makeshift meat pole in a draw you know it might not be a spring there but just that mm -hmm. thicker greener grass is going to hold that cool air a little bit better and we'll we'll put our meat pole over there and shuttle the meat up there and hang it there and like you said from there it's a matter of you don't have to scramble to pack it out. That's not the, the race at that point. The race is making sure that meat's cooling. If it's not, figuring out a way to help it cool faster. Don't stuff it in your backpack and race back to the truck trying to, to get it there. It's going to probably cool better hanging exposed to the air than in a pack. Yeah. And if it has to hang there until the next day and you come back in, that's actually probably better than trying to put it in your backpack and shuttle those out and just slowing that process. Cause that initial process of cooling that first two hours is critical. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And that's why if you do have somebody with you, it's so much nicer because while you're working on the carcass, that person can be shuttling this meat. And there's times we've probably shuttled meat to a shadier or cooler place, you know, 400 yards at times because it's, it's worth the effort to get it someplace that's that much cooler. Uh, the the risk reward is is worth the effort. I mean, 400 yards is not that far to carry something if that's what you got to do to get it in some shade and get it where there's going to be some wind. Yeah. And again, you know, going back to the, the three things that hurt elk meat, you have to have game bags. Yeah. Make sure you're putting that in a game bag because when it is hot like this, you're usually contending with bees and flies at a much higher rate than, yeah. than when it cools down a little later in the fall. Uh, and if you get those flies, those big, I mean, it does not take them any time to find the meat. And within three to five minutes, if that meat's just hanging there, or if you have a game bag there and it's open and you don't have that meat sealed off, they start laying eggs on it and then it just ruins the meat. And so, I mean, you want to immediately get it in a game bag. If you have a good game bag, it's not going to hold that heat in or trap the meat. So it's not like you're putting this game bag around it and slowing the cooling process. It's going to cool just as fast. So you get it in the game bag, keep the dirt and the bugs off of it. But then I've heard of people taking meat and putting it in a creek, yeah, which is not good for the meat long term. That that moisture on it is going to inhibit, speed up the bacterial period. process. Yeah, and so you, I mean, yes, put it in a cool draw, hang it above water, 
but actually submerging meat in water is not a good idea. Yeah, I've I've never done that. I've heard people who do it, and I'm like, ooh, in hot weather, that meat's not going to dry immediately, and heat and moisture are the prime breeding grounds for bacteria, which is what's going to spoil your meat. So I, yep. I've never submersed it. I've heard people say, oh, yeah, I bring dry bags, and I put it in the dry bag, and then I put the dry bag in a creek, and I'm trying to figure out, well, usually dry bags inhibit the transfer <laughs> of heat. But maybe, I, maybe I've just not done it, so I don't understand. But I've yeah, never, I've never found the need to, to do it. Yeah, I don't think so. You need to overcomplicate it or overthink it. It's that, that heat transfer from inside the ball of, of mass to the outside air. You just want to speed that up as much as possible. And and it'll work it, even in the hottest temperatures. I think that's the thing to, you know, people say, well, I don't archery hunt because it's too early and, and I'll lose the meat. There's no way to, to get the meat out when it's 85 degrees. There is, and it's, mm -hmm. it happens all the time. And fortunately, I've only had one hind quarter in all of my years of hunting, only had one hind quarter that started getting bone sour. And it was, it was 80, 85 degrees. It was the side that the elk laid on. We didn't find the elk immediately. It took probably an hour, hour and a half of blood trailing to find the elk. Yeah. By the time we got there, got the hide off, got that front side, everything was fine. We flipped the back side over, got the hind quarter off, hung it there. When we opened up that back side, you could start to smell a little bit of that happening. We opened it up, let it cool out, and we might have lost uh, five pounds. Yeah. maybe eight pounds of meat there that we had to cut off from around the bone that had started going bad. But that's the only elk in, you know, 30 plus years of, of hunting elk that we've ever lost any meat to. And I would say 80% of the elk I've shot have been before September 15th. So earlier season, we deal with the heat. It's just a matter of, of knowing how to take care of it and then acting quickly and being confident in your way and ability of taking care of it. Yeah. I started out with cheesecloth type game bag <laughs> and found out that, you know, this is just my personal experience and opinion. So if someone has a different opinion uh, or different experience, I get that. But uh, those worked okay for deer until you start putting, you know, a hundred pound hind quarter boned in hind quarter in one of them. And the mesh, the gaps in the mesh spread so much that the flies are landing on it. It's getting full of dirt. So uh, I'm like, well, this isn't working. So then I did the pillowcase and sheets thing from the, you know, down at the thrift store. <laughs> and uh, that, you know, I had mixed results other than the fact that it's cotton and it did not transfer the, the heat as fast as synthetic. And when it gets moist... It's, it really doesn't do the job uh, like a synthetic will. So now I use these reusable, washable, synthetic game bags. They're way stronger. They transfer heat way better. They transfer moisture way better. Uh, I can put a whole hind quarter of an elk in there and... It's going to support it. It's not going to expand. You know, the, the gaps in the fabric are not going to expand that allow the flies to come and land and, and, and put eggs on my meat. So it's been a bit of an investment in uh, synthetic game bags. But because they're washable and reusable, for me, I, I swear by them now. Yep. Yeah, good game bags are, are vital and a part of making sure that that meat's preserved. Uh, I think, you know, and we can probably move on now to the next phase, which that meat's hanging there, it's cooled or it's cooling properly. You get it back to camp and then what? Do you have to rush and get it in a refrigerator? Do you bring a, a walk-in cooler with a generator? Uh, I had a guy email me the other day and said he picked up a freezer on Craigslist for a hundred bucks <laughs> and he has it mounted on his trailer that his four-wheeler sits on and he has a Honda generator on it. And when he gets there, he's planning on just firing that freezer up and running it for a couple hours, putting the meat in it, cooling it down, and then shutting the lid on it and keeping that cool air in there and maybe starting it up every 12 hours or something to let it run for an hour. And I think that's a, a great idea. I don't think it's necessary, though. Once I, I was going to say, as, assuming that you're willing to deal with the logistics and cost and, you know, because when you bring a generator, then you got to bring gas for the generator. And so there's... 
there's a lot to doing it that way, and I've heard of people doing it also. I, I think what happens often is you have two or three guys elk hunting, and the first person shoots a bull on day two of the hunt, and they're there for a six-day hunt. Now you're saying, all right, we're in the backcountry. How do I keep this bull from spoiling now that we have it back at camp? And for me, the, the this is, a, you know, part of when we, you and I did that video about camp selection or that podcast about camp selection. Uh, if I can, I love to find a water source nearby because we all know that evaporation is happening all day long. In any place there's evaporation, it's going to drop the air temperature anywhere from 5 to 15 degrees uh, right at the, the area of evaporation. So if I can, I like to find a place that's shaded that has a little creek or a spring or a seep, and I'll go hang that meat right uh, on a meat pole right across that that water source where that evaporation is happening because if it's a hot day and you go walk over to a creek and put your hand near the surface of the creek within a foot or two it's amazing how much that temperature difference is near where that evaporation is happening so that's one of the things i'll try to do once i'm at camp to try keep meat uh preserved for a longer period of time because you know the the other two guys in your camp it's like, well, I don't want to quit. You know, we got four days left to hunt. Uh, so how do it, it, it comes down to how do we keep this meat from spoiling now that we're back at our camp and we got more days here while we're hunting? Yep. And you don't need to, for us, if it's convenient, we'll drive it into a butcher. And sometimes you can find a cooler where you can hang it for a week and they'll charge you a nominal fee to hang it. Uh, Sometimes we have enough time that they can actually process it for us and get it frozen so that we can transport it easier. But for the most part, like you said, if it's a long ways out and it's going to take away a, a day of hunting, it's not imperative that you drive it into town and get it there. You can hang it that first 12 hours is the most critical. And once you make it through that first night, when it's cool the next morning, it's going to stay cool. If you keep that in the shade, and like you mentioned, hanging it near a creek or anything like that, once it cools down initially, if you're able to keep it in the shade, and the, even if the temperatures are getting up into the 80s in the sun, that meat's going to be fine. It's not going to spoil. It's just that initial period that you usually have to worry about it or not taking care of it uh, and leaving it exposed to the sun. Yes, it can still spoil at camp, but that that initial 12 hours, I think, is the most critical. So yep. hang it, plan for uh, for the full day, know where the sun's going to be, keep it in the shade, keep it cool, and it's going to be fine there for three or four days. It's not going to hurt it at all. Yeah, uh, we, But if, if it is an option to take it into a butcher, that's a that's a great option. Sure. But I, the other thing, and, and again, this all depends on the, the lay of the landscape and the amount of trees and, and vegetation on the landscape. But if you can find even a little roll to a hill where the north face right off the crest has some dark timber, just that north face is going to, one, stay cooler because it's, it's not going to get the direct sunlight during the day. And usually those north faces, it you, you're going to have all day shade in some of those spots rather than partial day shade. And you're going to have a breeze blow. The, the closer to the top of the ridge you are, the better the chance you're going to have a breeze going. So I, I would say... If I had to design a perfect place to hang an elk, it would be 50 feet off the north side of a ridge in, yep. in the trees. And it'll stay for a long time. Even if, like you said, even if the daytime temperatures are getting up into the 80s, it won't spoil once it gets cooled off that first night. Yep. And then I think the the last phase as we talk about it is transporting it. You know, if you're driving from Colorado back to Michigan or something, and you know, you've got a 30 hour drive ahead of you, that meat in the back of the truck is probably going to be exposed to a lot of heat that won't be good for it. So you've got to think about how am I going to transport the meat? If you shoot it on the last day of the hunt, you don't have time to process it. It's still on the bone. You know, how do you transport that for 30 hours in the back of the truck? You obviously don't leave it laying there exposed to the sun, but uh, again, another portion of that planning that needs to be 
needs to happen before you're successful because you don't want to scramble and say, well, we've, we're stuck with a tarp and hopefully driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour is going to be enough cool air on it to, to let it cool. It's not. That heat is going to, to be bad for it. Yeah, I, if at all possible, I try to let it hang overnight and get to that ambient temperature that is what the air temperature is. Uh, I, when I do put it in coolers, I've always let it cool, then I bone it. And then I try to put it in my coolers. I'll wake up really early in the morning and I will fill my coolers then because my coolers, the actual temperature of the coolers, is that cooler ambient air temperature also. I'll put it in there and I'll, I usually bring with me some sort of frozen milk jug or something else, uh, jugs, multiple. And uh, if I know that that meat is cooled and that it's now safe to put it in uh, a cooler because it's it's lost that, that really hot core temperature. And this is assuming you shot it the day before. I put that thing in a cooler with as much uh, non-meltable ice as possible. Uh, I, I don't like having ice that melts and turns into a big watery mess down in the bottom of my cooler, which is why I use milk jugs and stuff like that. And some people will ask, well, how, many, how much cooler space does it take to get a, an elk home? Uh, and that depends on how much ice you want to put with it and how far you're going to drive. Um, so uh, I, I always have uh, two 65 quarts and an 85 quart, and I can get an, a trimmed out elk home in two 65s plus an 85, and, but that allows me ample room for ice to keep it cold. And I don't open those coolers till I get home. Uh, I know there's the tendency of, oh, I want to look and see how it's doing. <laughs> All you're doing then, it, because you're, the time you're worried about that is usually in the middle of the day. Oh, man, I wonder how my meat is doing. And you open it up and whoom, a whole bunch of that cold air is out, replaced by warmer air, and you're just you're defeating the purpose. So if you have a high-quality cooler... And just bonsai home, man. You know, you got this meat, you got to get it home and get it home in good condition. Uh, be prepared. Be thinking about how you're going to do it. And don't worry about, uh, some people worry about space and they'll say, well, do you think I could fit it in 265 quarts? Yeah, you could fit it in there if you don't want any ice. <laughs> or if all you do is grab the back straps, tenderloins, and you know do a rough trim of the quarters, but if you're going to trim it up properly, if you're going to salvage every bit of meat, uh, you're going to want more cooler space rather than less because you need the space for ice or whatever your cooling source is, uh, dry ice, I don't care what it is. Uh, the more cooler space you have, the, more, the greater the ratio of ice to meat that will keep it cold longer. Yep. Yeah, and, and you're talking there, meat off of the bone at that point. Oh, yeah, Putting for sure. in those coolers. And, and I did a, a video recently about what you do if you have the meat still on the bone. Um, you just have to make sure that the inside of that cooler, it doesn't matter, you know, the, the quartz or whatever is not nearly as important as the dimensions. If you're trying to get a, yeah. a bone-in quarter in there, need to realize that quarter is probably going to be 34 to 36 inches long and the inside dimension of that cooler needs to be long enough to hold that because there's no stuff in a, a quarter with the bone still in it into a cooler that's too small you can't manipulate those shapes very well yeah that's <laughs> that's just not gonna work if if you try a bone in hind quarter uh yeah good luck with that i guess is what i'd say if you get too small of a cooler <laughs> yeah and for me, I don't, you know, I know you carry multiple coolers full of milk jugs that are frozen and keeping those milk jugs frozen all week. So when you do need them, they're there and ready to go. I have found that most of the time within an hour of anywhere we're elk hunting, I'm going to be in some kind of a small town and be able to find dry ice. And dry ice allows you to pack a lot of meat into a cooler and not take up much room with the, with the jugs. Yep. The last thing you want to do is put cubed ice or something in there that's going to melt and turn into water. And then your meat's sitting in water. That's 
that's the absolute worst thing you can do is have that meat sitting in water as you're transporting it. So either yeah. use something that's protected like a milk jug that's even when it does thaw, it's not getting meat on the, on the, or it's not getting water on the meat or use dry ice. And a couple of, of uh, things to remember with dry ice is when it melts, there's no water, which is, is why it's preferred. Yep. But the other thing is, is it's really, really cold. And if you set a block of dry ice right against the meat, it's going to burn, freezer burn that meat. It literally will turn the meat black and it won't be good. Yeah. So you want to have cardboard or something in there to create separation from the, from the meat and the ice. And then again, you'll make sure you have enough. We usually put, I think, about 8 to 10 pounds of dry ice in a cooler, which is going to cost you probably 20 bucks. And you put it in the cooler and it's going to last for probably a good 18 hours. And when you open up that cooler, it's like a a refrigeration unit in there. It definitely keeps that inside of the cooler cool. Yep. No, that's, that's the other option. Um, But I guess the, the point of all this, everything we've been talking about is cool, 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 (laughs) temperature, temperature, temperature. Um, and once you get it home, you know, sometimes you just, you try your darndest, but there's still going to be some hair and maybe some dirt on the meat. Once you get that back to camp, you can clean that up some, and you certainly can clean it up at home, but you can't do anything with your, with that meat if you've not let the temperature moderate properly. Yep. It's, you know. I I always say, I'll I'll worry about a few hairs and maybe a stick or a piece of grass when I get home. But I don't want to get home with spoiled meat because that that just defeats the whole purpose of why we hunt. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, So, Randy, I know you've got a a video out on your YouTube channel of the gutless method. Yep. So do you, don't you? Yeah, we've got one uh, Elk 101 YouTube uh, if you are a member of the University of Elk Hunting online course, the video, uh, fully detailed video is in there. And the beauty of that is you can download it and use it offline. And so we get, it's amazing every fall how many emails and messages we get saying, I didn't realize the importance of being able to take video offline until I got my first elk down and was sitting there going, what do I do? opened up the app, watched the video right there in the field, and it, it will guide you through step by step. So yeah. uh, if you're a member of the online course, don't forget that is available to, to download inside the app and take with you into the field. Yeah, and you're going to get a kick out of this, Corey. Uh, our good friends at Gerber have asked me, they said, this fall, you need to shoot an elk in the morning and film every bit of this step by step in complete detail and we want you to do it in the morning so you got good filming light and we're going to create a whole bunch of videos that next year we got an idea that we're going to make these videos available to people who buy certain Gerber products so it's not available right now but it's something they're asking me to do but if I don't shoot an elk they're not going to (laughs) be I don't know what they're going to do to me yeah, that's that's always the, we want it in a really good setting where you can really see what's going on. We want it in good lighting and yeah, yeah that's, that's usually when you shoot one on a steep rocky hillside in full sunlight in the <laughs> middle of the day. And, <laughs> yeah, so, but which gets me, you know, some people ask about knives uh, in really hot weather. I don't want to, I, I mean, anymore, I'm, I'm a convert to the replaceable blade knives like the Vital that Gerber has. Yeah. Uh, and for me, I don't, and when it's really hot, I don't want to stand there and have to resharpen a blade. Um, I want to just replace it and continue with my work. And anymore, I'm that way no matter the time of year, but I'm... I, I can think of all kinds of reasons why I'm a bigger fan of the replaceable blade. Totally. Like the Vital. But yep. No, it definitely saves time. and Yeah. It, uh, so, you know, some people get their first elk or their biggest elk, and then they end up with salvaging the cape and the head and everything else. The cape, to me, is a whole lot easier to care for than the, the, than the meat. The cape... You know, that's the last thing I worry about is getting the cape off the animal. 
once it's there. And I'll remove the head right at the atlas joint. And then I'll probably, I usually bring the whole head, antlers, and cape to camp. And there at camp, I'll take the, the cape off the remainder of the head and the face and do it do it there. And a cape will store, it, once you, again, once you let it cool and hang uh, and get to a, a cool ambient temperature at night, a cape, if you put it, you know, match the flesh side to the flesh side and roll it up, it'll last quite a while. A lot of people think, oh, I got to bring salt. I got to this, I got to that. Um, keep it cool and it'll be good for a couple days and then get it to your taxidermist right away and let them deal with the lips and the, and turning the ears and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's great advice there. And, you know, we've, we're very, it, it's very rare that we shoot an animal that is worthy of a taxidermist and it definitely adds yeah. a, a lot of complication and challenge to dealing with it in the heat. Just that height yeah. is a whole, whole other thing that you have to consider and think about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would tell people that if, if you, if it's hot, think long and hard about keeping the cape because that changes how you're like you were talking about almost doing a cut along the belly and you know on the lower side and rolling that hide over that's the preferred way because one you can do it quicker you can get the heat out of there quicker and when you have to roll the carcass over you protect the meat on the other side as you roll the carcass Whereas if you do decide you're keeping the cape, now you're doing a dorsal cut instead, which takes a lot more time, exposes the meat to a lot more dirt and other stuff when you have to roll it over to get to the other side. So uh, when someone says, oh, I want to keep the cape, I kind of look at them like, are you sure? <laughs> because you're you're asking to complicate our lives here by a significant amount, but if if you want to do a shoulder mount, I'll, I'll do this so you can keep your cape. But just understand, it's a whole different process of how you get that hide off in a hurry. And you've got more hair, you got more dirt if you keep the cape than if you do it the way you were talking about of just start right along the bottom. Come, you know, almost like the reverse of a dorsal cut almost. Yep. Just, and, yep. So there's no right way, there's no wrong way, uh, but I do think there are some better ways and some easier ways that people will get comfortable with as they do it more. And that's why so many of our videos that we talk about in this stuff on our YouTube channel are about doing this with deer because a lot of traveling elk hunters don't have an elk to practice on, but they have a lot of deer they can practice on. And yep. it's it's the same thing, it's just a function of size and scale and you might be able to handle a deer all by yourself real quickly <laughs> if you got a buddy you're he's gonna really be a hunting pal if he's there to help you when you have that elk laying on the ground yeah uh, i'm trying to think what the factor of work and headache is of doing one yourself versus doing one when you have an extra person Oh, it's it's more than double. <laughs> I guarantee you that. Just the just the small little things of holding that hind quarter, holding that back leg up so you can get underneath and get the skin off of it so you yeah. can make the cut to to detach it from the uh from the hip joint there. Just little things like that that when you're by yourself it's like okay, how do I get my shoulder underneath this leg, reach in with my left hand, make that incision but still hold on to the quarter so it doesn't fall in the dirt when it does come loose. It's yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, if if you are doing it by yourself, bring some parachute cord. Oh yeah. I mean, if you don't have a buddy coming with you, that parachute cord is really going to be helpful. If you got someone with you, all right, maybe you don't need a lot of parachute cord. I carry, you know, fifteen feet of parachute cord, whether I have someone with me or not. But. Uh, yeah, it's just practice whenever you can. Uh, it's I, 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 That's how I've learned, uh, and I've, I've made some mistakes. It's like, well, why did I do it that way? That's kind of stupid. Uh, but it's uh, it's something you got to do. You got to be prepared for, especially when it's hot like this. Um, don't take that lightly. You got this wonderful big amount of meat there that you're going to enjoy all year. 
last thing you'd want to do is lose some of it. Yep. No, and it's on our mind. We're uh, opening day here in Idaho is August 30th. The weather where we're hunting is uh, shown to be a high of 83. And on Saturday, the second day, the high is 87. That's up in the mountains where we're going to be hunting. So, you know, this warm weather meat care is is something that we deal with, especially as archery hunters and uh, need to be prepared for it. Yeah. Do you, do you think uh, a lot of people uh, uh, <laughs> walk up and uh, the first time they see one, it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what have I got myself into? Uh, and I, I, I do think, I think there's probably some level of, oh my gosh, uh, belief there. So the more you're around it, the more comfort you have, the more experience of, and I don't care what species it is, whatever you can practice on, I, I know people are probably tired of me saying that, but gosh, practice as much as you possibly can. Yep. And go help a buddy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean that uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but also uh, I mean it in all sincerity of, uh, you know, go do the, do the good thing of being a good hunting friend. But also you're going to, maybe they got a slightly different way of how they do it or a little trick that they do it. Um, odds are you're probably going to learn a little bit also. Yep. Absolutely. So, uh, when, when are you going out, Corey? We are going to hunt Idaho opening day and, and day number two. So the 30th and 31st of August, and then we leave for Oregon on September 4th and we'll hunt Roosevelt in Oregon from the uh, 5th through the 13th and then back to Idaho for the second half of September, just hunting Idaho. All, uh, all the hunts we're doing this year actually just over the counter general hunts, um, no draw hunts other than obviously Montana is a non-resident you have to draw, but we just drew the general tag there and we're going to come over and let you show us how to, uh, how to keep our feet warm in November in Montana. Yeah. Well, I've been scouting, I've been researching, I've been trying to figure it out, but, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't punch your tag just yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how to take that. Uh, what, what I mean is it's not like there's going to be one slam dunk. Okay, November 6th, I know that's the day you're going to fill your tag, da-da-da. Uh, it's it's going to be hard. You, I don't know why you and Donnie decided to come the second week of rifle season. It's the hardest period to kill a bull elk in Montana is the second week of rifle season. Well, that's why we picked it. Okay. Well, if we went over there and hunted, you know, a game farm during the peak of the rut, everyone would say, well, yeah, that's, that's easy time to kill it. Now we've already bottled up a whole bunch of excuses and justifications if we <laughs> don't kill one. So it's uh, like, well, it was full moon. It was the hardest week of the season. The weather was horrible. We were fogged in and it snowed the whole time. And Randy's feet kept getting frostbitten. And so, I mean, we just, we have all these excuses ready to go. All right. <clears throat> well, I... I don't feel that we could uh, wrap up this podcast without talking about a really cool public access project that RMEF did in Washington the other day. Um, I think a lot of people are like, Washington has elk? Oh, yeah, Washington <laughs> has a lot of elk. Uh, I've never been there hunting them, but uh, RMEF uh, over on the east side of the Cascades, it's not too far from uh, Yakima, uh, there's 2,000 elk that migrate between the summer and winter range in this area, and they acquired 4,486 acres uh, of amazing elk habitat um so those people who uh hunt that part of of the the elk world uh are gonna have uh, a lot more access than they otherwise would have uh again it's it this is one of those classic examples uh the landowners uh, uh the, i hope i don't mispronounce this it's called the van wyke w-y w-y-k family own this property and they uh they wanted to work uh with rmef work with washington uh what do washington call it uh department of fish and wildlife i believe yeah and so now uh 
there's this big addition to what's called the Oak Creek Wildlife Area. And uh, that's a big chunk of ground, especially when there's 2,000 elk that use that ground, 4,486 acres of critical ground. It's not always the amount of ground. Sometimes it's the, um, you know, the quality of that ground uh, in this case is is really good. Thanks to the donors, uh, the volunteers, and the members of RMEF, they're just adding more and more public access. Which benefits us. It benefits elk. It, it's a win-win. And that's why I say if you're not a member of the Elk Foundation and you're an elk hunter, I would love to hear the reason. So far, I haven't heard a single reason. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's sent in a reason and said, you know, here's why I'm not. But we do get a lot of messages from people saying, I've elk hunted for 20 years and never took the time to sign up. I did it. And I feel better about, about being an elk hunter because I support something that supports us and elk. And it's, uh, we've got to think a lot farther out than just today and tomorrow. We've got to think about years down the road, what the elk are going to need, what are, what the next generations of elk hunters are going to need to be able to continue hunting elk. And, that's the Elk Foundation's mission is to ensure that they're around. Yeah. So go to rmef.org and become a member. And if you want to know where they're doing their work in your backyard, you can go to the tab of conservation, drop down to where it says where we can serve, and it'll show you a map by year. Uh, I think since 1990 is what they've been tracking it. And you'll see all kinds of little dots in your backyard probably that is whether access projects, habitat projects, where it's habitat improvement, controlled burns, weed control. Uh, a lot of work's been done. I think right now it's it's almost 7.5 million acres of habitat improvement and getting close to 1.2 million acres of public access. That's crazy. That's a lot, isn't it? Crazy cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then there's also, if uh, if you've got the OnX Hunt app, oh, yeah. there's a layer on there where you can see that same information where it shows, you know, which I'd never used it before, mm -hmm. uh, but turning that layer on, it's pretty pretty impressive to go into an area and realize how much work's been done right there in that specific area that you're hunting or that you've downloaded. And so that layer on OnX is a pretty cool feature to take a look at as well. Yeah, Corey's referring to the RMEF layer. So if you go into, I think it's, it has all the states and then it has hunt. I think it yep. might be in the hunt package. And yep. Click the RMEF layer and it'll show you all the RMEF projects in the area you're hunting. So... Yep. Well, Corey, I, I hope that you uh, you have to employ these tactics we just talked about. Um, I'll be in Arizona next week helping a friend who has an antelope tag, and then it's back to Montana for elk, 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 and more elk. <laughs> well, make sure you save one of those uh, September elk for November. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll work on that. But uh, we just got a great big shipment of bear spray here. Uh, they sent us a <laughs> bunch of bear spray. So we got one bottle with your name on it and one name with, or one bottle with Donnie's name on it. Uh, I say that because the likelihood is we're going to be in the thick of grizzly bear country, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all, especially in November. I'd much rather be there in November than in September. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, it'll be fun. I'll look forward to, to hearing your reports. Uh, and uh, you guys you guys always have good luck. It's just a matter uh, of how many you guys are going to find. We always have fun, and we're uh, definitely looking forward to upping the fun factor and enjoying this special month that only comes once a year. Yeah. Well, folks, so. thanks for listening. Good luck out yep. there. Yeah, good luck for everyone who's heading out, and uh, keep us posted. We'd love to continue getting those messages and emails from you. Oh, sure. yeah. Where do they get that? Where do Contact they? us through the website at elktalkpodcast.com. Just click on the contact link and send us an email if you've got ideas for guests or topics. Or uh, when you're successful, send us a picture. We'd love to share in that success with you. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Good luck out there.